if we want the transcendent wisdom of our bodies to be at its height, we need to work on our bodies and minds to make them strong containers. Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archive teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello and welcome to Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host, and I work with Dr. Sabota on the creation of his business. And this week on the podcast, we have an episode that is all about how we know things. And Dr. Sabota goes into detail about what that looks like and how we get clear about what we know. This is an in-depth look at knowledge and from the Vedic perspective, and I hope you enjoy it. If you'd like to study with Dr. Sabota, he has over 200 hours worth of courses online at drsvoboda, D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A dot teachable dot com slash courses, and you can study all the different vidyas which he talks about in this episode of uh, the Indian sciences, including Ayurveda and Jyotisha and other topics. So we hope you enjoy this and we will talk to you soon. Vakritinda Mahakaya, Suri Koti Samaprabha, Nirvignam Kurme Deva, Sarvakar Yeshu Saravadam. Of the many different words in Sanskrit for knowledge, possibly we can divide them into three groups. One is the group that comes from the root ma, which means to measure. The word maya comes from that same root ma, because maya is that which can be measured, that which is always measuring. Measuring is maya, basically. When we take <clears throat> ma and we add the prefix pra to it, pra offering meaning in all directions or thoroughly, we get prama, and prama means the correct measure. It can also mean true knowledge. And from that, we get the word pramana which means a method of obtaining knowledge. Now, all of the different Indian sciences have their own set of pramanas. And in Ayurveda, which I know the most about, there are four pramanas, so four methods of obtaining knowledge. And obviously, we're trying to obtain accurate knowledge. Why are we trying to obtain accurate knowledge? Because, as Vimalananda was always fond of saying, it's always better to live with reality, because if you don't, reality will eventually come and live with you. So it is always useful to deal with reality. We're living in an age in which Living with reality is not so popular. It is much more popular to live with imagination, like the imagination that there are, that things that are happening, that we are being told by the media are happening, and we get them into our heads that they're happening, but they have nothing whatsoever to do with the reality of whatsoever, whatever is actually happening. So we have to try to avoid that if we don't want to find ourselves out on some conceptual limb sawing it off and ending up in a much worse condition than we were when we started. So the four pramanas that Ayurveda has 
are these, Pratyaksha, Anuman, Upaman, and Aptavakya, or Aptopadesha. Pratyaksha is the most important, and Pratyaksha means Pratyaksha, means in front of your eyes. So Pratyaksha means personal experience, using your senses to identify something. If you take a chili pepper, you put it in your mouth, you bite into it, you will notice that the chili pepper is hot. You cannot pretend after that that it is sweet. You cannot pretend that it is salty, unless it happens to be a pickled chili pepper. You cannot pretend it is anything other than spicy, which is what it is. If you see something, if you hear something, you are getting direct perception, direct experience, and this is said to be the most reliable method of knowledge, except, of course, that sometimes your sense organs don't work properly. So what if, in fact, your sense, your, the, your sense of taste has gone screwy and you bite into the chili and it tastes sweet? You will be experiencing something that will temporarily be real in the sense that your body is going to be reacting to that real for you, but it's not going to be real for everybody else. You can go around preaching to all and sundry the gospel of the sweet chili, and people are not going to believe you because they will be biting into chilies and saying, huh, like the other multi-billion uh, people uh, uh, population of the world, I taste it as being spicy. Um, and this is why we have that English proverb, believe only half of what you see and none of what you hear. So we ideally are able to make our senses sufficiently refined and our power of discern discernment sufficiently well cultivated that we can be able to identify when we can rely on a particular um, sense perception and when we need to be suspicious of it. Um, usually, a good test is whether you feel in your gut intuitively that something is accurate, that that perception that you're having is an accurate perception. This is not foolproof, but it's certainly better than simply using your rational mind to think about it or your emotional mind to emote over it. This is why Vimalananda, my mentor, was always fond of saying, Anubhav Siddha Karo, which means make your experience Siddha. That word Siddha has a number of meanings, but what he was, in this case, it would be perfect your experience. Whenever you are using your sense organs, make them work as accurately as possible, interpret them as accurately as possible, and continue trying to refine them. Don't ever assume that you've got to the point where you are completely refined and uh, that your perception is ultimately accurate. He used to say that a rishi, and the rishis were the great beings who perceived, who saw the hymns of the Veda. Rishir darshanat. A rishi is, we call a person of rishi because they can see. And he used to say that you could call them rishis, but an even better term for them was maha anubhavi or maha anubhavi. That means a great experiencer, someone who has experienced so many things and experienced them in so many contexts that that individual never has any kind of distortion when it comes to perceiving things accurately. So this is a Rishi, of course, you and I are not at that state, but we can strive to make our perception as accurate as possible. It's always very important to remember that no matter how accurate our perception is, it is only a teeny tiny itsy bitsy fragment of what there is to perceive. We take in one 
uh, 10 millionth probably of the electromagnetic spectrum, maybe a 10 billionth in the context of hearing, even less in the context of sight. We can only, we, we can't smell as well as so many other animals. We can't taste as well as other animals. But in spite of that, in spite of the fact that we're just taking in tiny, tiny fragments of what we could take in with our sense organs, and we're doing that because, of course, if we took in everything, it would overwhelm us and it would be meaningless. We're always trying to take in the information that we need to have for our own personal benefit as individuals. And as our five organs of perception have evolved, they have evolved what are called in the Sankhya philosophy, tan matra. Tan means that, and matra comes from that very root ma. Matra means a portion. So tan matra means that portion of reality that this sense organ can tap into. And from those tan matras have been derived our perception of the five Mahabhutas, the five elements that make up the world, earth, water, fire, air, and space. But it's because we are experiencing pieces that we are experiencing only fragments of even earth, water, fire, air, and space. Now, it is noteworthy to me that in addition to the fact that we're only taking in teeny tiny amounts of what we could take in from the outer world, we are also compressing it dramatically in order to get it into the rational conscious mind. We take in about 10, 11 million bits of information through our sense organs every second. 11 million bits, of which 10 million bits are coming from the eyes and uh, a million bits from the ears and less, 100,000-ish bits from the various other organs. Of these 11 million bits, the conscious mind can process 50 bits per second. So 11 million down to 50. This is at least five orders of magnitude that the is, hap is being compressed. I mean, we know about what happens with compression. You compress a photo into a JPEG, you can compress an audio file into an MP3, and lots of details are lost. And that compression is nowhere near in this similar kind of ratio. So the conscious mind is able to deal with only a tiny amount of what the sense organs are taking in. The rest of the body is responding to this via the subconscious and unconscious minds. And this is why intuition is so important when it comes to really knowing something because that intuition is employing the vast majority of the data that our sense organs are taking in. So, Pratyaksha is the most important pramana, but it's not the only one because we can't have experience of everything all the time. We also have to be able to employ other methods. The next method that is regarded as being worthwhile in Ayurveda is anumana. And anuman means emphasis. And the traditional uh, example of this is yatra, yatra, Dumaha, Tatra, Tatra, Wanhihi. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire. Notice the way in which this particular syllogism is structured. It does not say sometimes there's fire when there's smoke. It does not say whenever there is fire, there is smoke, because sometimes there is no smoke coming from fire. But if you see smoke, and if you are sure that it is smoke, if it is not a cloud, it is not steam coming off of uh, some uh, power plant somewhere, uh, it is not uh, a, a flock of tiny insects that look like smoke, or birds that are far away and look like smoke, or bats, if it is really smoke, 
it has to be coming from fire. We may not be able to see the fire. We may not be able to hear or otherwise perceive the fire. But if there is smoke, there has to be fire. So this is where inference is useful. If we know that smoke is always associated with fire, then we can know that there will be fire even if we only see the smoke. This is very useful in Ayurveda. If you see a symptom that is always associated with a particular disease, uh, for example, uh, in the case of uh, primary tuberculosis, almost always there is a rise in temperature in the evening. And this often is the first sign that somebody may be suffering from tuberculosis. There are, other, there are other situations like this. Very, very commonly, someone who starts to urinate a lot and who urinates a lot at night, especially if it starts to happen suddenly, this often is the prodromal symptom of diabetes. So there are a number of they may not be absolutes like the smoke and fire thing, but they may be sufficiently pathognomic that it may be able to assist us to make a valuable diagnosis. So inference, where there is this, there is definitely this. Where there is one thing, there is then the next thing, all we have to do is make sure that we have the right connections between the right things. The third of the pramanas is upamana. And upamana means analogy. An analogy is where you, you can't draw a direct, you can't have personal uh, direct experience, you can't draw a direct connection like with inference, but you can say, it's like what happens in this way. And that can assist you to get a general idea and possibly a visionary, a, a visual concept, a picture of what the reality is. Um, in Ayurveda, a common example is how we describe the way the tissues in the body get nourished. And depending on the tissue, it may employ one or more of these three ways. One way is called the kshir dadi nyaya. Kshir means milk, dadi means yogurt. And that means the entire, one of the entire datus is converted into the next datu. So it is said, for example, that Rasa, the first dot, the first tissue, the first datu, is converted into recta, into blood, kind of in this way. So if you've ever made yogurt, you will know that you boil up the milk and you let it cool slightly, and then you add a little bit of the yogurt starter, and then you put it in a nice warm place and you leave it overnight, and the next morning it is it is turned into yogurt. So we can understand by analogy that this is somehow kind of what happens when the, the plasma in the blood is turning into the, the blood itself. This is not exact, but it gives us kind of, it gives us a framework in which we can employ other perceptions to try to get a closer picture of what's actually happening. Uh, the next, uh, is the Kedari Kulya Nyaya. And Kedara means a field, and Kula or Kulya means a channel in a field. So an ir it's the law of the irrigation channel. And that is that when water is poured into the irrigation channel, it flows into the channel, and then whatever plants happen to be along the channel, they are able to pick up the water, they suck up the water, and they are nourished by the water thereby. So this is a great example of how blood nourishes flesh because the blood moves around in the irrigation channels known as the arteries and the veins, and it goes through all of your muscles, all of your tissues, and it leaves nutrients, water, not only water, but the 
the, the internal equivalent of manure and fertilizer at the base of each of these muscular structures and the muscles are nourished as a result. And the third analogy employed for this uh, nutrition of the tissues is called kale kapota nyaya. Kapota means a pigeon. And so the kale kapota nyaya happens when the pigeon picks up a seed and wanders around with it and drops it somewhere. And then that seed starts to sprout. So this is a good way to describe the action of hormones, for example, because the hormones wander around in the body and they go to certain receptors and then they cause things to happen at those receptors. So providing images can often assist us to get a sense of what is going on, even if it is more difficult for us to be able to compose some sort of rational explanation for what's going on. So that is upaman. So we have pradyaksha, that's experience, anuman, that's inference, upaman, that is analogy, and the fourth is apta. Apta means, optim actually means completed, but an apta is a person who is an expert, who has completed his or her education and knows what he or she is talking about. And therefore, if you go to that person and say, <clears throat> you know, it is my feeling that things are this way, but could you please um, tell me whether I am thinking about this accurately or not? And this person who's had more experience and not just experience, but has had good results from that experience, it, that person will be able to very possibly advise you. Well, my experience is not like this, or well, it, I used to think that way, but now I've realized that it's not that way, or whatever. So obviously there is the possibility that the person you go to who's an expert is not really an expert and is just a fake, or that person is an expert in everything except the thing that you're asking them about, or the person is expert in the thing they're asking you about except in that one aspect of it and they happen to not know what they're talking about, or uh, it may be a bad day for them and it may be a bad day for you and the planets may conspire to cause your interaction not to go well. There's all kinds of possibilities that may go wrong there. I tend to believe that just as using the GPS system, the GPS system works because of triangulation. It takes three different uh, measurements and then it's able to identify where you are because that gives you the three dimensions that allows things in three-dimensional space to be clearly and precisely identified. So it is very useful not to try to rely just on one perception. You can rely on one perception and one inference and one analogy. You can rely on one perception and one inference and one expert. You can rely on one perception for yourself, from yourself, one perception from a friend, and the testimony of an expert. If you can get three different measurements that are giving you a similar result, then that provides you a certain confidence that at least for that moment, you're moving in the right direction. Now, the good news is that once you start moving in the right direction, you tend to morphogenetically cause things to continue moving in the right direction. This is the benefit of inertia. The negative part of inertia is that when you're stuck somewhere, then you're stuck. The positive part of inertia is when you are moving in the right direction, you will tend to continue to move. To move. Inertia is both static and dynamic. If you are uh, immobile, you will tend to remain immobile. If you're moving, you will tend to remain moving. So this is a tendency towards continuity. So once you start to really get the pramana down for you, and once you start to really be able to, by, by testing and by exercises and by experiments, to know 
what it is you actually know and to be able to distinguish between what you think, what you feel, and what you actually know, then you can start moving in the direction of really possessing vidya. And that word, this is the second of our words, meaning wisdom, knowledge. And vidya means real, honest to goodness knowledge. And real, honest to good knowledge honest to goodness knowledge is something that is not just you, it is you are taking advantage of something that is beyond you as well. The word Veda, the four Vedas, Rug, Yajur, Sama, Atharva, that word Veda comes from this Sanskrit root vid, which means to know. Another word that comes from vid is vidya. So vidya is a word that means a body of knowledge that is well-developed, but that is not just a bunch of data that has been collected together. It's a body of knowledge that has prana inside it. Prana is inspiring it. It's a living body of knowledge. It's a goddess. There is a vidya for each of the different classical sciences of India. I like to call the, the natural process of the universe that promotes healing in all living beings. I like to call that the Ayurvidya. So this, is, this process is present on the entire earth. Everywhere there are living beings. Whenever that living being goes out of balance, there is a force that is driving to try to make that living being come back into balance. I like to call that the Ayurvidya, that is the, the embodied goddess of life who is trying to make life remain intact in whatever that particular organism is. If you are stud studying divination, Jyotisha, then what you are really doing is you are trying to make yourself a vehicle for the Jyotir Vidya. Jyotir, Jyotish means light. So you're trying to make yourself a vehicle for the lights of all the different lum the luminaries, the sun and the moon, all of the stars, all of the different things that happen in the sky. You're trying to become a vehicle for not there's the, the surface things, but the meanings behind them so that, that so can, you can use that knowledge, that knowledge can speak through you in order to assist people with their concerns. Similarly, if you are a physician, then you should be not trying to do things on your own, not trying to use your own cleverness, but trying to allow yourself to become a conduit through which the Ayurvidya can flow so that that healing energy of the universe can actually do the healing. In the Charaka Samhita, which is the uh, most um, well-known uh, text of Ayurveda, there is a very clear statement that since the beginning of time, no doctor has ever healed any patient. It is nature who heals the patients. So we are trying to once we get to a place where we can understand what is right and what is wrong, we can identify at least reasonably what is true and what is false, then we can start to become good vehicles for whatever vidya we're trying to work with. There is the vastu vidya. There is the uh, danur vidya that is for working with the, or swara vidya, working for the, with the prana in the body. There is the nritya vidya, working with dance. There is the gandharva vidya, working with music. So there are many different, they, these are very similar to the nine muses in uh, the Greek muses that were the, the inspiration of the individuals who were trying to work with their subjects. So this is, this kind of knowledge, vidya, is real knowledge because even though it has been textured in, it has been constructed in, it has been structured in, you and all of the 
all of all of the preparation that you have made on, in, in your organism to act as a host for this vidya, it is the vidya that is actually doing the work. And the third level of knowledge and wisdom is where we get to real wisdom. <clears throat> and that is employing the root dnya. Dnya is very difficult to pronounce in Sanskrit because it is a combination of J and N with no vowel in between. So in North India, they tend to try to pronounce that gyan, for example, or gya. And in West India, they tend to pronounce it dnya. And in South India, they do different ways. But the fact is that it is j plus na, dna. So not so easy to pronounce. But from it, we get the words dnyan, vidnyan, and pradnya. Nyana means real wisdom. That's where you have gone from not just having, <clears throat> not just having praman, not just having uh, to work with these different ways of figuring out what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false. You've gotten to where there is a vidya that is, that is providing you clear perspectives on what is real and what is not real, provided you keep yourself out of the way of its action and you don't let your ego get involved. And once you have used a vid, and there are many, there, rasa vidya is alchemy, but rasa vidya is also the science of bhakti. So that's also a vidya. And that will also transform you. And if you work with bhakti rasa long enough, then it will also produce jnana. In fact, Mahaprabhuji Vallabhacharya, the fifth of the five great acharyas of Advaita Vedanta, said in one of his compositions, jnani chet bajet krishna. And the implication is, if someone who is a jnani, if they have, if someone who has really obtained knowledge, not just knowledge of a specific um, uh, 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 valuable form of knowledge like medicine or astrology or whatever, but knowledge, transcendent wisdom, knowledge of the supreme reality, that's what jnana is. And you can have a small amount of jnana or a large amount of jnana, but it is that knowledge, the transcendent wisdom that is jnana. So Wallabhacharya Ji was saying that if a person who has gained this knowledge will then become a devotee of Krishna, then that will be extraordinarily unique. That will be a wonderful ex uh, experience of both of those paths to reality. So jnana is Vimalananda used to say, jnana is ordinary transcendent wisdom, and vidyana is specific transcendent wisdom. That's where you start to ha be able to perform, uh, have siddhi, supernatural powers, and do unusual things that cannot be done by ordinary human beings. And beyond that is pradnya. And pradnya is the transcendent wisdom Again, there is that pra, which means in all directions, a uh, 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 profound, uh, uh, like that profound pra. That pra is, so it, it covers everything. So pradnya, uh, the uh, Buddhists have a, a, a scripture called the uh, pradnya, uh, or rather it's a uh, parimita, it's a, it's a perfection called the Pradnya Paramita. And so that means where wisdom has become your very nature. And in Ayurveda, we sometimes talk of Pradnya Parada, Pradnya Aparada. And Aparada means a crime. And in this context, Pradnya does not mean the transcendent wisdom of the supreme macrocosm, the cosmos. It means the transcendent, trans, transcendent wisdom of the microcosm of the human body. So pradnya parada is the ultimate cause of all disease. Why, why, what does that mean? That means that the body knows what is the right thing to be done for the body, 
But the mind, because of a desire either to enjoy something or not to enjoy something, prevents the body from doing what it knows it should be doing. So that is a crime against the transcendent wisdom of the body, and that leads to disease. And the reason that happens is because of upada, of having an allurement by something. So when you have an allurement, of course, you are allured only because your knowledge, your wisdom, and, and, and your alignment with reality has been compromised in some way, usually because of desire, some kind of desire. So if we want to become vehicles it, that are able to employ the pramanas accurately, and if we want to become vehicle, vehicles for vidyas, and if we have a hope of being eventually able to, to, to manifest to whatever degree, pradnya, and if we want the transcendent wisdom of our bodies to be at its height, we need to work on our bodies and minds to make them strong containers because to control shakti <clears throat> is a challenging thing <clears throat> to do. And so strong containers are useful. And we need to uh, work on ourselves. We need to have routinely be performing exercises. That means if you want to be a doctor, you have to study. If you want to be an astrologer, you have to study. But in addition, we have to have good alignment with our personal deities, and we have to work to make sure that we are gaining the ishtabala, the intuition that we will need to make all of these vidyas functional in the world. Uh, it is very helpful if we grow up in a society or and culture that promotes this kind of movement in the direction of knowing things accurately. If this is not the case, then we need to create for ourselves. We need to have satsang with those who are similarly attempting to move their awarenesses in the right direction. It is very handy if there is some hereditary connection, if there is some pedigree. Vimalananda, my mentor, used to own racehorses, and he would have me search through the stud book frequently to find pedigrees of different horses. And it is often the case that if someone, and it used to be much more the case when life was simpler, that if you have in a family a number of physicians, then there will be hereditarily a kind of affinity for medicine. And this can apply to other subjects as well, of course. That may not be the case in your case, and you may have the you may have to work with hereditary challenges, with difficulties in your with your ancestors or with your with your actual genes and chromosomes that are making it a bigger challenge for you to achieve what you want to in the context of being able to know accurately and act as a repository for knowledge. Whatever it may be, whatever the challenges may be for you, whatever the advantages may be, you need to examine them very carefully and accurately, give them the proper weighting, and adapt for yourself, create for yourself the appropriate routine that you're going to be able to follow to assist you as you move from being aligned with accuracy using pramanas until you were able to serve as a vehicle for the vidya and employing the inspiration of that vidya to be able to move in the direction of pradnya. And at all times, continuing to recite the name of God, whatever name you are most familiar with, most comfortable with, most aligned with, and most beloved of, that will be the name that you will continue to want to recite. Ram Ram.